So I wanted to talk to you guys today about making energy matter. And I thought I'd kick things off by sharing with you four different images. And I promise to you the theme of this event is not toilet paper. Uh, but we have four very different things here. So we have toilet paper. We have Bigfoot. We've got some socks. And we have a black hole. The question here is, what's the common theme across all these four things? So I'll give you a hint. It has something to do with energy, and it has something to do with people. So noodle on this for a little bit, and we'll come back to this in just a little while. So we have an energy problem. <clears throat> we have increasing demand. We have limited supply. There's aging infrastructure in utilities. And we're seeing real environmental degradation as a result of the energy consumption patterns that we've had. So utilities have been looking at this as primarily a problem of how do you create enough energy through supply to meet this rising demand? And they've been making all sorts of investments, including new plants and renewable sources of energy, like wind or solar. But each of these investments that they make are extremely expensive, for one thing. <coughs> And second, they bring with them some of their own issues, including uh, issues with distribution and issues with energy storage. And who knows what the weather is going to be like one day. If it's not sunny or it's not windy, then the energy doesn't get produced. And so it begs the question, what if we just used less? What if we tried to solve this, this problem on the demand side rather than trying to solve it on the supply side? Clearly, it makes more sense to take that approach. And so there's a problem with this, uh, which is that it's very, very expensive for Americans to waste all this energy. In fact, Americans spend $30 billion wasting energy every year, not just spending on actual energy consumption, <coughs> but that's the amount of energy that they waste in their homes on their electric bills. And that translates to $20 per month per American family. And that's big money for a lot of people. And so in order to solve this problem on the demand side, people, and some very smart people, have been focused on trying to resolve uh, the messaging for consumers. To think about how do you explain to people how much it matters that they save energy. And obviously, one great way of doing that would just be to focus on the money itself. You use less energy in your home you pay less money on your bills. It makes a lot of sense. However, that message isn't really resonating. We're not seeing a lot of people who are actually dropping their energy use because of that kind of message. And so they move to alternatives, right? We talk about trees, right? So if you use less energy, then it's like you're planting trees. And if you use more energy, you're a tree killer, right? And so, you know, if you like trees, and everybody likes trees, then you must love polar bears, right? <laughs> they're cute, they're cuddly, although this one kind of looks a little bit mean. Um, but the message has sort of drifted towards environmentalism, which also makes sense. Because when I'm standing in a room, and I think about whether I should turn the light on or, or, or turn the light off, and I've got the light on right now, you know, if I leave the light on, then I'll be using more power. And if I use more power, then more energy has to get generated. And more energy getting generated means more CO2 in the atmosphere. Then you add into that the greenhouse effect. And then you add into that global warming. And now you take global warming, you've got melting polar ice caps, and suddenly all of our fuzzy friends are gone. And so that all makes sense, and it's a very logical argument for why you shouldn't use as much energy, or why you should just flip the light switch off when you're in the room. But I gotta say, even though I consider myself to be an environmentalist, at the same time, I can't go through all of these logical steps the whole entire time while I'm thinking about whether I'm just gonna turn the light off on the way outside of the room. And so this hasn't really been effective either. Now why is this? Why isn't this kind of messaging working for people? The reason that it's not working is because there's all these blockers that are out there, especially when it comes to energy. So let's come back to the puzzle that we had. Four very different things, and there's one common thing among them. And the one common thing 
that I would point to, I'm sure there are others, the one common thing that I would point to here is that Americans spend more time thinking about each of these four things than they do thinking about their energy use. Which is amazing, right? <laughs> spend more time thinking about toilet paper, the most simple and basic thing I could think of, the most esoteric thing I could think of, the most mundane and something that's even fictional. <laughs> They're spending more time thinking about these things than they are about their energy use. In fact, you people will spend more time thinking about your energy use during this presentation than most people will spend thinking about their energy use over the course of an entire year. Which is crazy, right? Six minutes. That's all we have. Six minutes a year that people pay attention to their energy use. So real quick show of hands. How many of you have checked your email in the last week? I don't think there's a single <coughs> hand that raised. Right? How many of you have been on Facebook or Twitter in the past week? How many of you are on Facebook or Twitter right now? <laughs> There's a couple of you out there. All right. How many of you have gone to your utilities website in the last week to see how many kilowatt hours of energy you saved or you used? Right? Nobody. Not a... All right, wait, wait. There's one. All right, we've got one nerd. All right, I like it. Um, right, so why is this the case? Well, it's kind of painfully obvious, at least to everybody but one in the room. Uh, <laughs> and the reason is because energy is boring. It's painfully boring. In fact, when I made these slides, this guy wasn't even yawning. <laughs> there he is now. Look at him. If anybody else yawns later, I know that's because you just saw a yawn. That's really um, <laughs> Here's a real energy bill. Boring, right? But also extremely confusing. There are all these different charges that are on the bill. Some of them make sense, some of them don't make sense. I can't figure out why I'm spending a certain amount of money on energy or what I could do to save. So we're not really helping ourselves with the way that we generate these energy bills. They don't make a, a huge amount of sense. And ultimately, I'm getting charged for kilowatt hour usage. Who knows what a kilowatt hour even is? You can't feel it, you can't smell it, you can't touch it, it's got no size and no shape. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense, and it's confusing. You know, this is the part of high school that everybody fails. So um, the last problem that we contend with is the fact that energy is actually very inexpensive. And so while there's this great potential for energy savings, because in aggregate, energy actually costs a good amount of money, it turns out that energy itself is very cheap. So a kilowatt hour of energy is about the amount of energy that it would take to power a 40-watt bulb for an entire day. And that kilowatt hour of energy costs about 11 cents on your bill. So energy is really, really cheap. How much money are you really gonna save by turning off the light for the one minute? But you aggregate these decisions over the course of an entire month or over the entire US population and it ends up being a really significant figure. So these are the problems that we contend with, and that's great, but what can we actually do about this? What are the solutions, not the problems? And I want to point everybody to a study that was conducted. And this study was conducted in 2007 by a man named uh, Dr. Robert Cialdini, who is a big inspiration to us at O-Power. Um, and he was doing his research in San Diego. And San Diego gets very warm in the summer, and everybody has air conditioners. And so he asked uh, students in a class to uh, help him run an experiment, which was to place these different door hangers on people's homes. And so for four consecutive weeks, every Saturday morning, they would choose a home, and, or they actually choose thousands of homes, and they would place these door hangers onto somebody's door over and over and over and over again. Right? And they would do this for the course of about a month. And so one house might get a message four times in a row that says, you should save energy by using your AC less and using your fan instead. And if you do that, you'll save money on your bill. The second message was an environmental message. And the third message was one about citizenship. So, uh, you know, be a good citizen and make sure we don't have rolling brownouts because there's not enough power to go around. So who thinks that the dollar messaging one would have worked best? Who thinks that the environmental message would be best? And who thinks that the citizenship one would be best? So it turns out that you're all wrong, <laughs> all right? 
not exactly fair. However, all three of these had no impact on consumption. So it was a big, big learning that, that, you know, that they came out of. It's a big insight, which is that it doesn't matter what the message is, none of them are actually working. And so they tried a fourth one. And this fourth one was actually about neighbors. Instead of saying, here's the reason why you should not use as much energy, it simply said, your neighbors are already doing this. Most of your neighbors are already doing this. And so people would get that message, and it turns out that that had a significant impact. 6% drop in energy consumption, a really big impact to their overall bill amount, a big environmental impact, just by placing this door hanger on instead. And so the message itself matters. But what's really interesting here is that these other messages were all reasonable explanations for why you shouldn't use power. This last one wasn't an explanation at all. It was just tying your energy use to the fundamental principles of human behavior. And so we at Opower were really interested in this. In fact, as it turns out, the company was founded because of this specific study. So we were interested in the application of behavioral science to drive behavior change for consumers and help them save energy on their bills. And that's exactly what the company does. But instead of hiring an army of college students to go around to these different homes, we try to provide that information via uh, paper reports that we send, via a web experience that's available, uh, and other applications such as email, etc. And so we started by thinking about what are the different behavioral patterns that we see, and which of those can we actually apply uh, to try to get this impact. And the first one that we started with was a really basic one, which is we all just want to be normal. We all just want to fit in. Anybody have a memory of junior high? That's pretty much my whole memory of junior high, was trying to fit in. It didn't work out very well, and I have a lot of dark memories. However, <coughs> Opower was able to use this insight and drive people to save energy by comparing their energy use to the energy use of their peers. So you can see what your energy is in a bar graph, and you can see how it compares to people with similar sized homes, with similar numbers of occupants, in similar geographies and climates, etc., and then get an understanding for the first time of how that actually fits in with everybody else. And so we started getting some interesting results from this, and it worked really well. So we started looking for all kinds of other behavioral psychology uh, applications. And there's two in particular that I wanted to call attention to. First, we care what our friends think. So this is not just what our friends think about us. This is what our friends think in general. And think about it. If you're going to go see a movie this week, are you going to go consult 10 different critics for this? Or are you going to go ask your friends which movie you want to see? And if 10 critics gave positive reviews to a movie, despite the fact that that's exactly what they do for a living, versus if you had 10 of your best friends tell you that you should go watch a movie, you'll probably pay attention to your friends. It's just the way that we are. And so we tried to apply this as well using Facebook. So if you can see your energy use, and you can see the energy use of your friends, and you can get a leaderboard and see how you actually do as a group, that ends up being inspiring to people. And so I don't have a great picture of that here because we haven't actually launched this yet. It'll be coming soon, but be on the lookout for it. And the last one that I wanted to show is, well, unless you're a politician, <laughs> we have a tendency to honor our commitments. Uh, and these are not just commitments that we make externally to our friends, publicly, even commitments that we make to ourselves. Basically, we hate getting called out where we said something and then we ended up doing something different. So Opower tried to use this as well. And we created an application where people can go to the web and set a goal for themselves to save 3% over six months or 5% over 12 months. And then we send regular communications back to those customers to give them a sense of how they're progressing against their goal. And if they're doing great, thumbs up. And if they're not doing so great, well, maybe thumbs sideways or even sometimes a little bit thumbs down. So the big question is, of course, does this actually work? Do we get the results that we're hoping for? The answer is yes, absolutely. In fact, we've seen some phenomenal results from the application of behavioral psychology to try to get people to become more energy conscious and to save energy. So the impact that we've had, 800 gigawatt hours of energy saved. Well, 
I get a lot of blank stares because exactly the problem, right? People don't know what a kilowatt hour is, so they probably don't know much about what a gigawatt hour is either. But here's something that you probably will understand very readily. $80 million of energy bills saved. That's a big impact. And that translates to 1.1 billion pounds of CO2 emissions abated, which is about the same as 5,500 cross-country flights. It's a lot of flights. So we've had some really significant impact. And O-Power is really just one example of how this can work and how these behavioral psychology approaches can be applied. We try to do this for energy efficiency, but the general concept of this is that you can change what people do without necessarily having to change why. This is not about the big, bold argument that goes on, you know, like the polar bear argument. This is about changing people's behavior to have the influence that you want to have by focusing on real, actual human behavior. So what I thought I would do is I would leave you with this. Uh, I'll share a personal story, which is that I came from California. Uh, I grew up there, and I uh, lived in the Bay Area for the majority of my adult life, having moved over to the Washington area about two years ago. And, transplanting my family with me and leaving some very good friends behind. And there's a lot of things that I miss about California. In fact, most notably, I think when I go try to find Mexican food around here, uh, it's probably when I miss it the most. Um, but I also really miss it because there's this amazing tech scene, and there's this vibe, and there's this, there's this mentality that's kind of, you know, because it's the center of what's going on in this technological revolution that we have. Um, but if I were giving this particular talk in San Francisco, what I would have is an audience of people who are paying attention to this to try to think about how can I apply these behavioral science approaches to the problems that I'm trying to solve, like getting more people to come back to my website or getting more people to click on my banner ad. That's actually the thing that I was working on last before I came here as well. Some people might be thinking about how can I get more people to become more addicted to my mobile social game? And what I'm excited about is the fact that I'm standing here in Washington sharing this idea with you because you guys are going to be working on such noble causes. You're going to be trying to get people out of their seats and you're going to be trying to get them to uh, go to the voting booth. You're going to be trying to get them to open up their wallets and contribute to some nonprofit organization. Or you're going to be getting them to volunteer for a political campaign or organize a protest. These are all the kinds of things that I would love to see this be applied towards. That's my challenge to you. That's what I'll leave you with. Thank you very much.